Okay, now we put it all together and look at reaction pathways. So we've looked at a whole lot of different reactions. Those reactions can be put together if we want to make a particular chemical. Now, there are usually a range of different paths that can be followed to get the same product, and we need to produce to um, choose the best path, the one that is uses cheapest raw materials, least energy, one that has the highest yield. You get a lot of product for a particular amount of reactant. You also need the one that avoids nasty toxic chemicals, whether they be solvents, whether they be byproducts. And the classic is the synthesis of ibuprofen. Now the original pathway that was developed when the molecule was first um, produced widely was this one here and it involves lots and lots of steps and lots and lots of bits being wasted as we go along so in order to get that carboxyl on the end first of all you've got to have various strange little groups like this it's actually quite difficult to do so it also contains various fairly nasty reagents, so chloro intermediates that have to be disposed of. It's difficult and expensive. However, a much cleaner, much more simple pathway was developed, <coughs> which has many fewer reagents. So hardly any groups are lost, hardly any of the molecules are lost as we move through to get our product. Now this diagram pretty much summarises the pathways that we've studied or the reactions that we've studied and the pathways they can form. So if we want to make say an ester or an amide we can Get there. These are the sorts of reactions that we have to um, use to get there. So if it's an ester, for instance, we've got to have an alcohol or a carboxylic acid. Now the alcohol can come via substitution reactions or it can come via addition reactions if we're starting off with hydrocarbons or it can come, we can get it from a combination of the two. The alcohol to carboxylic acids, we can directly oxidise it or we can do the roundabout route. So we have got different choices. So let's have a look at what impact, what factors impact on those choices. We need to get good tasting pineapple juice. How do we get good tasting pineapple juice? Well, we add some chemicals to it. That sounds pretty logical. So we've got to make ourselves some ethyl butanoate. Uh, what are the two reactants that are going to produce ethyl butanoate? Well, that's going to come from the alcohol, that's going to come from the acid. So ethanol, butanoic acid. Well, we can usually use hydrocarbons, so either alkanes or alkenes. So ethane or ethane for ethanol, butane or butene for butanoic acid. So we're going to make those two, and then we can react them together. So how are we going to get our ethanol? Well, if we start from ethane, this is the pathway we're going to follow. First of all, we have to do a substitution reaction. We have got no choice but to subject this to a pretty brutal attack with some chlorine and some UV light or some heat. We'll get chloroethane out of it. And then we can substitute that with hydroxyl group to get ethanol. Or we can use ethene. We get a much simpler addition reaction with HCl and then the substitution reaction with ethanol. Or we could do the direct addition. Phosphoric acid catalyst, 300 degrees uh, water vapour, 
and we get ethanol that way. Which one do we choose? Well, in this case, every reaction pathway is different. There are different factors involved and the best result is going to be different. So in this case, substitution with chlorine is not the way to go. It gives a low yield, it's indirect, and you get nasty chloro compounds. In this case, it's the direct reaction, which obviously doesn't have any chloro compounds, and in this case, it ends up with a pretty good yield. The yield you can only work out experimentally by actually doing the reaction and seeing how much you get. Butanoic acid, same basic issues, but it's interesting, there is a different outcome to it all. So, if we, to produce butanoic acid, we've got to get butanol. How do we get butanol? Well, we can do the chlorine substitution, then to produce chlorobutane, then the hydroxyl substitution to get butanol. Now note if we want butanoic acid, it has to be one chlorobutane to get us butan one ol So any two chlorobutane that we get is totally wasted. We can produce chlorobutane via addition with HCl, or we can directly add steam with a phosphoric acid catalyst, 300 degrees, etc., to um, one butene, and we'll directly get butanol. Now, in this case, the um, proportion of unwanted products that you get, one, two butanol in the case of the direct addition, and two chlorobutane in the case of the addition with HCl. Most of the product produced is those undesirable byproducts. So you're wasting huge amounts of your reactants. You actually, in the substitution reaction, you actually get a higher proportion of the product being one chlorobutane. So in this particular case, the substitution with chlorine is actually the preferred pathway. You get the highest yield. Then substitute it to produce butanol. So once you get your butanol, once you get your one butanol, you can then oxidise it to butanoic acid and then you can uh, do the condensation reaction with ethanol to produce the ester. Now, percentage yield, how do we work out which is the um, best pathway? Well, it's often the one that produces the highest percentage yield. What percentage of our raw material that we started off with, the butane or the butane, what percentage of that molecule ended up converted into the desired product, the butanol? So what we do is we measure how much product we actually got, divide that by how much we would have got if 100% of it reacted, so just do our stoichiometry, and then express that as a percentage. So, 3.6 grams of 1-butene reacts with steam, we get 1-butanol, 1.6 grams. Calculate the percentage yield. Well, that's our actual yield. Our theoretical yield is when we do the stoichiometry on 3.6 grams. So, I didn't even write an equation for this, you'll know. That's because we've got 1 to 1 mole ratios all the way through. The number of moles of butanol that we get is going to be the same as the number of moles of butene. So first of all we work out the number of moles of butene, 3.6 divided by the molar mass, 56, which gets 0.0621, and because it's that 1 to 1 mole ratio that's going to be the same as the number of moles of 1 butanol. We then work out the mass of one butanol multiplied by its molar mass, and what do we see? 4.59 grams. So that's what we should have got if all of the butene reacted to form one butanol. However, we only got 1.6 grams. That gives us less than 35% yield. 
So that's a pretty poor yield. Now we do that for each step in the reaction pathway, multiply the yield for each step, and we end up with results like this. So for pathway A, butane to chlorobutane to butyl, one butanol, 60% yield in this, that's really good. 85% yield here, that's, you would expect a good yield for that step. Multiply the two together and you get an overall yield of 51%. Once you start doing that addition reaction and you have to deal with the two chlorobutane problem, yield drops dramatically. Obviously the same yield at the same step, but two thirds of the yield here means you get two thirds of the, year, the total yield overall. What happens in pathway C, the direct reaction? 35%. No good. That's why we use the chloro pathway. A related concept is atom economy. Now, that looks more, for more holistically at the whole reaction process. So it measures, of all the different reactants that end up, end up being used in a reaction process, it measures what percentage of them actually end up in the useful molecule that you produce. So what percentage of those reactant molecules just gets wasted along the way? So the more steps, the more reactants you've got, the less of it ends up in the product, the poorer, the lower atom economy you've got. So molar mass of the desired product, the stuff that you're making at the end of the day, divided by the molar mass of all the atoms in all the reactants that go in to make it. So if we do that for the ibuprofen synthesis, where the green pathway, we don't have that many reactants. That's a catalyst, so we ignore that. So this is one reactant, that's obviously the main reactant. Uh, we've got hydrogen there as well. And then we've got carbon monoxide. Palladium's a catalyst as well. So not many, there's that little bit there, that stuff in red gets wasted. And so the molar mass of all the reactants together is 282. The molar mass of the ibuprofen that we want to make is 206. So our percentage of atom economy is going to be 206, that's the ibuprofen, divided by 282, that's all of the reactants, and we get 73%. That's pretty good for a reasonably complex synthesis. The brown pathway, We've got lots more bits being wasted along the way. So all those reactants go together. Total mass of all of the reactants is that. Total mass of the desired product is the same. That gives us an atom economy of 44%. So it's another way of um, measuring the efficiency of a sort of more complicated pathway. Okay. Have a go at the questions, and that is the end of Organic Pathways.